how it works with psilocybin? Yeah, and yeah, what you have Well, uh, I mean, I take, when I take psilocybin, I take it on an empty stomach. I don't fast or anything like that. I just don't eat for six hours. I don't call that fasting. Uh, and then I take it in silent darkness. That's number one, very important. The next thing is weigh the dose. You must weigh the dose because five grams is what you want. And I've had over and over the experience of showing somebody what five grams is and they're appalled. They say, my God, you can't be serious. I mean, I, w I take a, a fifth that much a fourth that much. Yeah, well, that's the problem. That's why you don't have elves in the attic and bats in the belfry like I do, um, you know? And so then you take it, and I take it on an empty stomach, and a lot of people don't like the taste. I don't really understand that. Uh, I just chew them up. I sit with them, and I chew them up. And then, huh? Dried. Uh, none of this mixing in applesauce or any of that malarkey. I mean, what's that about? Oh, well, fresh, 60 grams. 60 grams. Uh, because there's more than a, you know, there's a huge water loss there. And uh, then it takes, people sometimes say it came on within five minutes or it came on within ten minutes. I don't know what that could possibly be about. First of all, it defies pharmacodynamics to imagine that it could come on that fast. For me, it comes on almost always at the one hour and 20 minute mark. I think it can come on sooner than that. I think I'm fairly resistant to these things. In the hour, after I take it, I sit, I roll bombers, and I I carry out what all good Catholics know as an examination of conscience. This means you think about all the bummers that you're afraid are going to jump out at you as soon as you get loaded. If you will carry out the examination of conscience, you'll be so bored with that by the time the compound actually hits that you usually don't have to pay any dues because you've, you know, face the fact that you're a jerk 50 times in the preceding hour. So, uh, and then uh, the way I do it is at about the hour and 20 minute mark, and I should say in the time preceding that, you may have to go to the bathroom once, you may, uh, it makes your nose run, which is a funny thing. It also makes you yawn. These are definitely qualities of psilocybin not related to its psychoactivity. And um, and I think that it's very good to decide before it hits that once it begins, you will not alter the plan. In other words, you decide ahead of time, I'm going to sit here and do this because at about the hour and 15 minute mark, it will begin hitting you with stuff like, you'd really be more comfortable downstairs or you know, it's awfully hot in here. Why don't you get up and adjust the thermostat? All this stuff. You say, no, 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 no. We're holding the space and sit there. And then it begins to come on. And it comes, the image I have is like a, a jellyfish or a silk scarf or something like that. It just kind of drifts down and surrounds you. And at that point, I, I, I guess I pray. I say to it, you know, I'm completely in your hands, please don't hurt me, you know, I'm yours, I'm completely committed, I've held nothing back, so don't burn me, please. And, uh, and then there is a kind of, it's hard to describe, a kind of uh, potential begins to build up. And you say, hmm, the rush hasn't begin, begun, but it's, you can almost close your eyes and see millions of little psilocybin molecules elbowing serotonin molecules out of the way and fitting themselves into the receptor site and the electron spin resonance dynamics is beginning to shift and the whole thing is, gonna, is about to take off. At that point, I smoke furiously. And that usually is all it takes.
and it, it comes on and it the first rush is really astonishing. I mean, sometimes it's more mind-boggling than others, but I can remember situations where I would just see it coming and say, oh my God, you know, it's a it's hundred miles wide and ten miles high. Where are you going to run to? You know, it's just, you say, good grief. You know, I guess I'm not going to meet this one sitting up. I think I better lay down. And in about the time it takes to make and execute that decision, then it just hits. And it's like a tidal wave. I mean, I have the feeling when I'm doing it in California that everybody from Vancouver to Tijuana has just uh, crawled under their desk because you can't imagine this is happening between my ears. You know, it's more like an asteroid must have fallen in the Pacific Ocean and raised some enormous incoming wave. It's what it's sort of like. It's like watching a thermal nuclear explosion through 50 feet of crystal clear glass. So, you know, you're perfectly calm. It's not getting at you. But the energy that is being released in your presence is awesome. And then it... Uh, and sometimes in that first pass, you actually, the linguistic machinery is burned out. You've probably seen these scenes where they will test a hydrogen bomb and they set up cameras a quarter mile from ground zero, a half mile, a mile, two miles. And then when they actually detonate the bomb, they get the view from the first camera and then they switch to the second camera as the first camera is blown to bits and vaporized and they keep pulling back as each successive instrument is destroyed. Well, this is sort of the feeling you have as this thing spreads out toward you. And then it, uh, it does what it wants to do. It tells you what it wants to tell you and it's highly unpredictable. I mean, you cannot, people always say you should ask it a question. This seems absurd to me. I mean, I don't know. Once when my life was in turmoil, I, I, I did ask a question. I said, uh, I wrote it down ahead of time, and the, and the question was, am I doing the right thing with my life? And then when I got in there and I posed the question and the answer came back instantly, it was a, a rip-off from Lyndon Johnson. It said, what? kind of a chicken shit question is that to ask me I said oh sorry uh, didn't mean to presume you know <laughs> said get your act together and then we'll have a conversation but if that's what you want to talk about you should have taken MDMA and it uh, and then, you know, paralleling what we talked about this morning, and again, I'm just giving you my subjective take on it, it's like um, I come into a place, it's hard to describe, it's a feeling, and, it's, I, and, the, and the content of the feeling is, now the elves are near, but they won't appear unless I invoke them. And, you know, I wish I could tell you that I chant in Mandayan or something like that, but I don't. Well, I stole a line from an old, old I Love Lucy program where Ethel is talking to Lucy about UFOs. And uh, Lucy says she talks to the UFOs. And Ethel says, well, how can you talk to UFOs? And Lucy said, well, it's simple. I just say come in little green men come in little green men and that's what I do I say come in little green men and then there is a and women if there are any out there <laughs> and then there is a it's like a it's like, I, it's like a marching band. It's like a Nepalese marching band is what it's like. And it comes from a distance. Like there's a place in my vision that's small, a little dancing light and a, and a little faint sound. And the light comes closer and the sound gets louder until finally, 
you know, they pick me up on their shoulders and with tubas blaring and sack butt and rebeck and all of this stuff. And then they carry me around and talk to me. And it's, it, the whole thing is shot through with such a weird sense of zaniness, Irishness, Joyceishness. I mean, it's almost unbearable. It's so, um, I don't know, not exactly Disney-esque, because their humor tends to be a little more savage than that. And then that is part of the first wave, and then the rest of the trip unfolds pretty much as you... There's a kind of a pushing and pulling that goes on. You can direct it. Each one of these plants does have a character of its own. Sure. Um, one of the most puzzling things.